Okay. All right, men. Here goes. Did you spend enough on Valentine's Day? Yes? Okay. The average man in America spent $97.27. How do you rate? <laughs> Miser, wiser, you're wiser than most. Oh, or is it that you don't love your spouse that much? No, 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 no. Let's not go there. Um, Beth and I were going to have our wedding rings cut off on Valentine's Day, but we didn't get it done. Um, <laughs> it was a horrible thing. Maybe anniversary. <laughs> my, my. People are telling my ring is killing my finger, so it's going to come off one way or the other. So <laughs> it's a very romantic thing to do that we were planning for Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did spend some money. Uh, I bought some flowers, not ninety-seven dollars worth. And and for most of you, I, I for most of you men, I, I sound like I sacrificed a, a horrible amount. I, I went to see Pride and Prejudice with my wife up at the lead center. Now, for most of you men, you're going, oh, man, that would have been a sacrifice. Oh, he's a great guy. I actually like Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> I'm a big fan. I could have probably quoted the whole thing. Uh, and uh, they did a wonderful job up there. It was sort of like a radio play instead of an actual presentation, but they did a phenomenal job. I still don't think I spent 97 bucks. Now, the question is, is does that say something about my love for Beth? Does that say something about your love for your spouse that you'd spent less than $97? Or that you spent more? Anybody spend more than $97? <laughs> Not a one. Adam, I'm looking at you. I was hoping. <laughs> New hub covers or anything? No? Okay. All right. There was our one chance right there. The, the newlyweds, and so that didn't happen. It didn't gonna happen for the rest of us. Now, extravagance is extravagance. And, but once in your life, you had to do something extravagant, right, men? You had to go buy three months worth of salary and spend three months worth of salary on a big ring, right? The rest of the time we're going, no, I pay for bread, I pray for the food, I pray for shelter, I pray for... I pay for a car, you know, that's all she's going to get. I say I love you once a year, right? Steve's going, yeah, that's what happens. Paul is going, yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> Today's text is a kind of a Valentine story, a story that helps us evaluate just how much do we love Jesus? Um, how much are we willing to spend? How far are we willing to go? And it brings our love for Jesus into question. Are, are we being miserly? Are we being extravagant? Are we being reasonable? Do we love Jesus the way that we should love Jesus? This is a season of spiritual soul searching. Lent is designed uh, to, to bring us more into focus with our love for Christ. And, and so one of the questions that we're asking is, is, do we love Jesus enough? Are we praying to him enough? Are we talking to him enough? Uh, and we're going to be examining our love for Jesus over the next few weeks as we uh, look into this question of, of where do we fit in our love for Jesus Christ. Matthew has arranged a, a few stories in this section so that we do focus on, on our love for Jesus. Now, uh, we have very modern views of, of history. And most of our history books, we want them to be written in just nice chronological order. This isn't necessarily the way the Gospels are written. The Gospels are historical stories. They took place, but they are arranged to make points. They are sort of history being used in sermons. And so everybody knew the, the history and the chronology of the thing. Uh, they had heard the stories. And the way that the Gospels arrange them is designed to provoke us, to bring out certain points about this. It's not that 
they were trying to tell us, oh, these things happen in a different way. They're just designed to help us to understand and to search our hearts and to make points. First thing that, that I want to say about this particular thing is, is that the fulcrum of God's sovereign control of human history is the cross of Christ. Some of you are familiar with levers and fulcrums. A fulcrum is a point on which you can set a lever, on which you can set a crossbar. You can take a crowbar, and if you have a, a fulcrum in the right place, you can lift a car. Um, I think it was Archimedes who said, if you put a, give me a fulcrum in the right place and a, and a lever long enough, I can move the earth. God moves the earth through the fulcrum of Jesus. He takes a crowbar to our lives. He takes that crowbar and he jams it on top of the cross of Christ and he starts to move. He starts to move us. He starts to create love in us and wants us to love Christ the way that people in this story today love Christ. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all of these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to be crucified. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus has said this. In fact, it's probably the seventh or tenth or twentieth time that Jesus has said this. We have many times that this, this statement has been recorded, but it's getting close. Two days. Uh, in two days, Jesus is going to be delivered over uh, to his death. It started way back in Matthew 16, where Matthew records, uh, but what about you, Jesus asked to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus goes on to say in verses 21 and 23, from that time on, Jesus began to explain that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So way back, whenever Jesus first said, who do you say that I am? When he first challenged the disciples to confront this idea that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He also said, you have to deal with the fact that the Son of God has come to die on a cross. Now, we know what Peter said when Jesus said, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to die on a cross. Peter said, no, that's not going to happen. And Jesus accused Peter of demonic thinking, of satanic thinking, in saying that the cross isn't an essential part of this process. If we're going to accept Jesus, we have to accept the cross. The next story in Jesus' life is the story of the transfiguration. Jesus went up on a mountain, and his earthly disguise was sort of stripped away, and they saw him as God of very God in all of his majesty. And they said, oh, this is a good thing. Let's live here forever that wasn't going to happen. The cross still needed to come. And so as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Until the Son of Man has been killed and raised from the dead. And in verses 22 and 23, it says, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. So even the stories about the glory of God Showing up in Jesus and, every, and, them, and seeing Jesus that way, they're still hinged on that fulcrum of the cross. And Jesus has been telling them, preparing them, getting ready. They're going to kill me, they're gonna, but I'm going to be raised to life. And then in Matthew chapter 20, it says, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they will condemn him to death, and, cru and, and he will be crucified, and on the third day he will be raised to life. So at least three times that Matthew records, so far, we've seen Jesus preparing for them for this idea that he has to be crucified. And so here again he says, they're going to be hand, hand me over to be killed. It is not a new thing. He has been telling them repeatedly that this is going to happen. On those good days when they finally identify Jesus Christ as the Son of God, on those glorious days, when they see Jesus transfigured, on this Passover, when they think that Jesus is going to be right into, has ridden into town and is going to declare himself king, he has already told them and reminded them and, and tried to get it into their heads that he is going to die 
and be raised from the dead. It is not a new revelation. But I also think that, that for the disciples, this was this horrible um, intrusion into, their, into this glorious project that they've got going. You know, Jesus has been healing people. He's been raising them from the dead. They have had this great parade all the way from Jericho. Um, they have marched into Jerusalem with people raising palm branches and laying down coats and singing Hosanna and all these good things. And they, yeah, okay, let's just ignore that part for a while. They'd heard it, but, you know, we don't quite know what Jesus is going with that thing, but that can't possibly be true. But in all of our celebration, it is not an intrusion. It is central to what we do. The disciples had, had probably hoped that all this cross talk would just go away. You know, they I think, oh, he's just, you know, pessimistic. He keeps viewing this, this glass as half empty or this broken in half or whatever they thought it was. But it'll just go away in time. But the cross is not an intrusion. It is central to everything that we do, everything that we believe. Jesus Christ wants to have a relationship with us. We have broken that relationship with our sin. And God has to pay to heal that relationship. And he pays for that broken relationship at the cross. It is central so that we can have life forever. It is central to what we think. Now, a, year, a number of years ago, I read a book called Joshua. It was written by uh, Joseph Gersoni. Um, and it was a modern retelling of Jesus. There have been a number of these books that I've read over the years. One was called Jesse, in which the Jesus character was a woman. And that was quite interesting, and it, and it taught me some. And this book teaches me something. And in this book, Joshua, who is the Jesus character, and, and in case you don't know, Joshua uh, is the, um, the Anglicized, Anglicized, English, I can't remember what word that would be. Uh, it's the Americanization of the word Yeshua, which is Jesus' uh, Aramaic name, the name that Mary and Joseph would have called him. They would have called him Yeshua, and so Joshua is that name. And in this particular book, uh, Joshua comes to town, and he changes people in the town through his example. He loves people. He influences people. He changes them because of the love that he has for folks, and they change because of that love. And, and frankly, it's a tremendous book because it tells us we can change people because of our example. But it comes short. The book comes short because Jesus Christ doesn't change us by his example. We need his example, and we need to read his example and follow his example and love his example. But... Jesus changes everything because of the cross, because of his death, because of his resurrection. Because of that, we can be forgiven. Because of that, the, the, we can have a relationship. Because of that, the Holy Spirit can move into our lives and change us. And we can be changed. It's not by his example. It is because of his death on the cross. Matthew wants us to remember that the cross is where discipleship starts. When, when Peter finally acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, he starts with the cross. It not only starts there, it continues. Take up your cross daily and follow me. It ends with the cross. The cross is everything to Christians. Jesus is about the cross. The cross is the fulcrum. Matthew then tells us in verses 3 and 5, that the leadership had decided not to have Jesus arrested during Passover. It was too risky. It was, a, it was a horrible thing on their part. People were happy. There were tons of people there. They were clamoring for Jesus. They wanted to make him king. And their, the leadership were going, we got to get rid of this guy. we got to do him in. You know, he's just going to upset everything. You know, it's better that one person die than for the whole nation to, to go down in flames. And so they, you know, they thought they had to kill Jesus. And they had power. They had strength, they had planning, they had people, they had the military, they had the government, they had religion on their side, they had everything. <laughs> Do you want to know something? They didn't get their way. They didn't get the job done. You catch the irony here? 
they think they're in charge because they have the power, they have the, the money, they have the authority, they have everything. And yet Jesus is saying, no, 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 two days, I'm going to die. The, the leadership's going, no, 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 we can't do it now. We can't do it in two days. It's too risky. Jesus says, no, I'm the one in charge here. Jesus was in charge of these events. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He, he, he arranged it. He planned for it. He knew that the cross had to happen. Everybody else wanted it to go away, at least at this time, but not Jesus. It was necessary for Jesus to be the Passover lamb. Way back in Moses, 1,400 years before Jesus, Moses said that you need a Passover lamb to take away your sins. Taking that blood and, and smearing it over the doorposts, Jesus had to be that Passover lamb. He had to die on Passover, even though the leadership didn't want it. Proverbs has been reminding us, I had to segue this back into Proverbs. Proverbs has reminded us that Jesus is in absolute control over everything, whether it's rolling the dice or whether it's our most well-laid plans. God is in control. He is the one who is in charge. And Jesus Christ is going to get his will done. And that's true that the enemies uh, of God... All that they do is, is co-opted by God. But it most vividly comes true here when they say, no, we don't want to kill him now. We want to kill him later. And Jesus is saying, no, it's going to happen according to my will, not thine. The underhanded and ingenious plotting of Satan, of the leadership, is, is going to be woven into all the plans that God has. This great plan of restoring the relationship that we have. And they have nothing that they can do that is going to stop that. The most determined enemies of, of Jesus are just bit players. Whether we're talking about Satan, whether we're talking about any kind of government, any kind of power, any kind of authority, just bit players. God is going to see that redemption happen and that we can have a relationship with him. And that brings us to our first point. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus without embracing the cross. The cross is central. The cross is it. The cross is the fulcrum. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you understand that Jesus has to die to repair the relationship. You have messed it up that bad that you can't do anything without Jesus dying. You cannot be an enemy of God without being broken on the cross. If you want to go up against God, you can't accomplish anything. Jesus' enemies, Satan tried to keep Jesus away from the cross. The leadership tried to keep Jesus away from the cross. Judas tries to keep Jesus away from the cross. They are all broken on the cross. They are all stopped by that cross. It is God's fulcrum. At the cross... God sets his crowbar on that fulcrum and he changes the course of history. He changes our lives. He changes, he breaks us away from sin. He breaks us away from death. He breaks us away from our past life and he changes everything. Here God prize his disciples free from sin. And he forces open the gates of hell and death and allows us to into heaven. The disciple who understands the cross asks, how much can I give? <laughs> we come to a great story uh, in, in Matthew. In verse 6 it says, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. And when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. They were, why this waste? They asked, this perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. You know, as long as we've been in Proverbs, there have been so many verses on helping out the poor, I know where they're coming from. Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Now, I suppose we need some background to this particular story. There are a number of these stories, by the way. There's one involving Mary. Um, 
the uh, sister of Lazarus and, and uh, Martha. Uh, another gospel talks about a woman who is a, a fragrant, uh, flag, I was going to say fragrant sinner, flagrant sinner uh, who comes to Jesus and, and, and washes his feet. We have these stories, and we're not sure how they fit in. So I'm only going to look at, at this particular story, although we might bring in some others. But there are other stories, uh, and we're not sure how they all fit together. Um, the other thing is, is that this perfume was very expensive. You cannot buy this, you know, at Target. You cannot buy this at Von Mar. You've you got to go to Paris or someplace. We're talking $50,000 a bottle, okay? We're talking expensive. We're talking about something that was probably um, kept as an heirloom, you know, as part of the inheritance, as part of the estate. You know, we're not talking about something that, you, you know, you go buy on, on Valentine's Day and it may not or may not smell very good. We're talking about, wow, all right? Um, and this woman comes in. And she breaks open the bottle and she pours it all on Jesus' head. It's all gone in a moment. All gone in a moment. You know, if we had $50,000 and you went and wasted it on perfume, I don't want to come and have a talk with you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there are lots of people that need to be fed for $50,000. But this woman is commended. The most curious question about this story is did she know what she was doing? How much did she know about what she was doing? It says that she was anointing Jesus' body for burial. Did Jesus know that or did the woman know that? Exactly what did she know? William Hendrickson, who, who has written a commentary on, on uh, Matthew, says, even if the enemies of Jesus knew about his predictions, that Jesus had made predictions, and, and they knew, they posted a guard at the gate, at, at the tomb. They said, oh, he predicted that he would rise from the dead. They knew he predicted he was going to die. They knew he predicted he was going to come back from the grave. So I would guess this woman could have known that. And, and if they had known that, can't we assume? Now, Hendrickson thinks this was Mary, the sister of Lazarus in this particular story. And, and that's a possibility because she was involved in one of these stories. That this woman knew this much? Well, it is very possible. She knew she was going to anoint Jesus' body for burial. But she had only gotten as far as the burial. She doesn't anoint Jesus' body for the resurrection. That's not what Jesus says. She says, she is anointing my body for burial. And she thought this was the last time she was going to see Jesus. The last time thing that she could do for Jesus. And did doesn't say anything about the resurrection. Valentine's Day giving is hard when you're just trying not to get into trouble. That's a statement, okay? Try not to get into trouble. Okay, well, then how much do I have to spend? How little can I spend? What do I have to give? What do I can't, you know, okay, I've got to figure this all out. You know, just try not to get into trouble. Worshiping Jesus is a lot like that, okay? Worshiping Jesus is a lot like, are we just trying not to get into trouble? You know, okay, we'll come, you know, one day a week. All right. We won't get in trouble if we just come one day a week. But, we'll, you know, two days, it seems like a lot. Um, you know, but if I go any less, oh, I'll probably get in trouble if I go any less. People will start talking. We worship because we don't want to seem ungrateful. Okay, you know, I'll put money in the offering plate um, because, you know, yeah, Jesus has given me a job. He's given me a house. He's given me a country to live in. He's given me all this stuff. I don't want to appear ungrateful. Here's a dollar. Uh, Okay, you know, I can't appear ungrateful. Is that what we want? Is that what this story is asking to do? Is such a disciple in our midst as the woman, if, if this woman lived in our, in our church, came to our building, you know, participated in our worship, how cheap would she make us look? You know, she dropped $50,000 for nothing anointing his head? What's all that about? How cheap would she make us look? You know, it's an amazing question. 
So what are we going to do about this thing? To be like this woman, we have to start thinking like this woman. We want to have this kind of love for Jesus. We want to express this kind of love for Jesus. We have to have the same thoughts as this woman. This woman was so extravagant uh, in her love, I believe, because she had listened to Jesus. She knew that Jesus was going to die. She believed him when he said, in two days, I'm going to die. She believed that. She listened to Jesus. We have to listen to Jesus. We pour out so little because we fill up so little. We rarely listen to Jesus. She listened and she poured out. She poured out extravagantly because she listened attentively. Think about the people who were at this particular dinner, okay? It was held in the city of Bethany at the home of a guy named Simon the leper. Now, lepers were not allowed to associate with anybody, but this guy had been a leper, and now they were associating with him. My guess is that he had been healed by Jesus. So he comes to Jesus with this gratitude in his heart of being of being healed uh, by Jesus. There's Peter. Early on in, in Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law. Well, maybe he wasn't that grateful then. Um, there's some mother-in-laws in here. I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> you know, he had to be amazingly grateful, okay? Because Jesus had healed someone that he loved dearly. Lazarus was probably at this meal. This was in the town of Bethany. You know, when Jesus was there, Lazarus was probably there. Even if this woman wasn't Mary, Lazarus and Mary and Martha were probably at this meal. Lazarus had been given his life back by Jesus. He had to be grateful for this. And yet all of these people thought that Mary's worship was excessive. They were all sitting around going, ooh, this money could have been given to the poor, you know, and, and sold for that. Is there any chance our worship is like that? Yeah, Jesus has, has healed me from cancer. Uh, but, you know, I, I give enough. I come enough. I, I pray enough. I, I worship enough. Oh, Jesus has given me a nice job. You know, but, you know, I've got other things to do. You know, and, and there's poor to be taken care of. Yeah, I give my money to the poor. Are we cheap like that? You know, are we, are we ungrateful like that? It's an interesting question. So we appreciate Jesus and marvel at what he can do, but, and we're honored to be among his friends, but we're not deeply stirred. You know, we're like Simon the leper. Yeah, he healed me. Peter, yeah, he gave me my mother-in-law back. All right, I want money back. No, um, you know, Lazarus, he brought me back from the dead. You know, that was a horrible thing to do. Heaven's a much better place. But we're not deeply stirred by this. This year, during Lent, we are emphasizing prayer. Um, before we gather again next Sunday, are we going to talk to God about the gratitude that we have? Are we going to be extravagant in our prayers? We can't begin by thinking about what we're going to give God. We need to think about what he has given us. He gave up heaven voluntarily. You know, not kicking and screaming like I'm sure Lazarus did, but voluntarily. He gave up everything. Dying on a cross, that's extravagant love. Our, let's think about that before we think about what we're giving back to God. Think about it until your heart starts to fill. And then search for some perfume that you can pour out on Jesus' head. When we realize just how much Jesus has done for us, we can be extravagant in our love. Ask the Holy Spirit to help us in our weakness, in our dullness. How wonderful it would be. You know, I was reading this verse earlier, and I had to stop. I couldn't go, and I had to, I had to collect myself. To hear Jesus say to you, you have done a beautiful thing for me. Oh, to hear Jesus say that to me. That would be amazing. The disciple who does not understand the cross asks, how much can I get out of this thing? Matthew puts this story 
of this lady who does this extravagant thing, shows extravagant love against a very different story about a man who's only out to see what he can get. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? No one knows for sure why Judas turned. John says that he has been a, was a thief from the beginning and, and stealing, and he was interested in money. You know, we don't know what his motivations were, but they caused him to do something horrible. At the heart of the betrayal was the cross. He had no room for a dying Savior. He hit that cross, and he said, that I cannot deal with. I don't want God to die for me. I don't want that relationship to be repaired. I'm not going to do it. The cross is always the stumbling block to the faithless. Anyone who tries to follow Jesus without putting the cross front and center is going to fall over that piece of wood, is going to fall over the fact that Jesus Christ paid for us to have a relationship with him. The irony here is that Matthew puts this story of this extravagant love against Judas's question, what are you willing to give me? She wanted to give everything she had, and he wanted to get something. Well, what did he get? What was Jesus worth? It was worth the smallest amount that was allowed to, to pay back uh, an owner for a slave that they had lost. Uh, in Exodus, the damages, if you killed a slave accidentally, were 30 pieces of silver. Judas got exactly what Jesus was worth in the world's uh, currency, the price of a dead slave. What can I get? 30 pieces of silver. A slave. What can I give? Extravagant love. There are disciples who have embraced Jesus um, because they think that God will make their life easier. That what they can get. You know, they want, they want the camaraderie that we have at church. They want the fellowship. They want, they want uh, health. They want the blessings that it comes from, from living a Proverbs kind of life. They want this, and they do this. What can I get? The question is today, what can we give? Like the seed is sown in rocky places. They, the seed gets planted in their life, but, you know, it's just not enough nutrients, and there's too much sunlight, and I don't really want to do this. You know, and so when bad things start to happen, they give up on God. There's a little Judas gene in all of us, I suspect. I've been watching this new show called Elementary, and this last week they had a, the, the warrior gene, which is turning people into sociopaths, and, or makes them that. And I'm going, I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, frankly, I think there is a Judas gene in all of us. It makes us figure out, what can we get out of this? That's why we need this, this Lenten season to search our souls. The main difference between... The man and the woman, though, is she understood the cross, he stumbled over it. We all have that little Judas gene in us. We all have to fight that. Not many disciples, even on their darkest day, even when they give in to the Judas gene, go as far as Judas did. But we don't have to. We, you know, we just might be disappointed with what Jesus did for us this last year. We might just be disappointed with our lives, with, with our marriages, with our jobs, with our house, with our cars, with our life. We're just a little disappointed in all of this. I like that ringtone. <laughs> Makes me happy. <laughs> there is a verse in this whole section that is out of place. In the, same, in the story before this, in the story of the, of the young lady, it said the same thing, but I think it belongs here as well. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? How terrible it is to be offended by worship and oblivious to betrayal. This is what they were. They were oblivious to betrayal, and yet they were offended by the worship. This is a statue. It's underwater in the bay at Genoa, uh, Italy. It was placed there back in 1945. Uh, and it is there to bless the harbor, bless the ships, bless the sailors, bless the, the, the fishermen that go out. Uh, and it's underwater. 
over the last 50 years, it has gotten, you know, barnacles growing on it and, and things. One of the hands got knocked off uh, somehow uh, in this thing. The only way you can see it is, is, to, is to go scuba diving and, and, and look at it. And so here about five or ten years ago, they, they hoisted it up. It weighs about eight tons. And they hoisted it up off the bottom, and they repaired it. They fixed it. And put the hand back on, scraped it all off, you know, uh, tried to help it out. And then they lowered it back into the abyss. It's known as the Christ of the abyss. My question today is, how can I repair my relationship with Jesus? He's been deep inside of our hearts for a long time. But have barnacles grown up? Have plaque grown up? I'm mixing my metaphors now. How can I repair the neglect that I have done? How can we give extravagantly? Let's pray. Father, you have given us two amazing examples. And Lord, we may never have the opportunity to give like this woman did. And, and Lord, we pray that we will never have the opportunity to betray you like Judas did. But Lord, we pray that we would become more extravagant in our love. More desirous and grateful and loving and, and overpouring in our love for you. Lord, we pray that this would come about during this Lenten season. May our prayer, may our Bible reading, may our, our fellowship, may our love for you just grow. In Jesus' name we pray.